All right, well, uh, this evening I'd like to read another portion of 1 Corinthians 13 and perhaps uh, that which is the, the heart of it because it describes for us uh, what this love is like, the kind of love that we are to express towards one another, uh, towards our neighbor, towards our, uh, even our enemies. This is the kind of love that was in the heart of our Lord Jesus and it's the love uh, without which whatever we do is going to mean nothing uh, to the Lord, which means it will bring then no benefit to us, no profit to us. We're not going to be rewarded for it because it has to be motivated by a love that is that love the Spirit of God gives us. So having read the, um, the meditation, which was the first three verses, let me read for you verses 4 through 7. Paul writes, Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Well, may the Lord uh, bless his word to our um, uh, edification, to our building up into the image of Jesus this evening. Now, this morning, remember, we um, <coughs> saw Jesus call to love our neighbor. And our neighbor are those who are near to us. Our neighbor is our fellow man, it includes our family, you know, those that we usually think of as uh, well, the ones that we, we love the most. But we saw that it especially applies to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It applies to those who live outside of our family and outside of the family of God in our neighborhood. And it even applies to our enemies, as we saw in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember, uh, the lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor wanting to justify himself? And Jesus said the parable of the Good Samaritan, your neighbor is even your enemy if he happens to be in need. Jesus tells us that we are to be uh, as he is to his neighbor. As Martin Luther said, we are to be as Christ to our neighbor. Jesus was a Good Samaritan to everyone that he met. And that's what he calls us to be. We are to love as the Father loves. Again, Jesus came to express or to reveal to us the Father, and this is the way the Father loves. He is kind to ungrateful and evil men. This is the way Jesus lived while he was on earth, and this is the way he continues to conduct himself in heaven. Remember, all power and authority has been entrusted to Jesus. He's in control of everything that's going on. He is the one who gives the good things to everyone that they have to enjoy. He's also the one who takes those good things away uh, when in his justice he determines so to do. But this is how our Lord Jesus also tells us that we are to shine his light by being as he is toward everyone. This is how we reflect his glory. We are to do this at all times and in all places and again particularly uh, toward those who are in need if we have the ability. Now, remember, too, we're talking about spiritual warfare, so this also is exactly what Satan doesn't want us to do because he hates us, and as we've seen, he hates everyone. You know, Satan hates even those that belong to him, that are in his kingdom, because they are in God's image. He doesn't want them to be saved. He wants them ultimately to be destroyed. And so he wants us also to hate them. And so he tries to engender in us the exact opposite of what our Lord essentially is commanding us and calling us to do by tempting us to focus on everything about our neighbor and our enemies that we don't like. All their flaws, all their sins, all the personal offenses that they have given to us. And his purpose behind it is so that we do not love them as Jesus would have us to love them, that we do not reach out to them and try to help them, try to show them how to be saved. And his ultimate purpose, again, is to destroy them. 
you know, we, we ask ourselves this question uh, from time to time, why is it so difficult to evangelize? Why is that something that it's hard to kind of get the motivation to do? Well, the reason is because of spiritual warfare. Satan is trying to stop us, and he uses many different things to try to stop us. He kind of, you know, points out certain things about us to make us feel inadequate so that we won't even attempt it. I can't do it the way other people could do it. If somebody else, if somebody, you know, like this person over here who's, who's maybe his work or his calling is to evangelize, if, you know, when Billy Graham was alive, if Billy Graham were here, he could do it. Or maybe Franklin Graham or perhaps some other evangelist. But if I do it, I'm just going to make them hate Jesus even more than they do because I'm just not going to do a good job. Or he might make us afraid to do it. You know, they might get angry at me. They might try to hurt me. So I'm not going to do it. But here, he also tries to weaken our love so that we just flat out don't care. You know, we don't care about them. We don't care whether they're saved or not. Maybe we don't even want them to be saved if they happen to be one of our enemies. This is really, admittedly, one of the most difficult things that the Lord calls us to do, to love our neighbor, particularly when it applies to our enemies. But again, it's what Jesus did. Uh, Jesus was willing to face their ire. Jesus spoke the truth to those whom he knew would hate him and want to kill him. He ministered to them. He did miracles in their sight, knowing that they would reject him. And even when he was crucified, he still prayed for them from the cross, and he calls us to do the same. So now the question this evening is, how can we, how can we do this? How can we love our neighbor? Especially, again, how can we love our enemies? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand what it is that Jesus is actually telling us to do here when he tells us that we need to love our neighbor. Now, we already saw this morning, yes, he means that we do need to keep the commandments that have to do with them. You know, the, uh, we might say the last six commandments. We need to do the right things, the things that love requires, the things that are the fulfillment of love. Uh, love is the fulfillment of the law, as Paul tells us. Our love has to have the right form. But we do need to understand, too, that Jesus is not telling us that this love that we are to have is necessarily going to be a love for the object in the sense that our enemies, uh, that we're supposed to find them attractive and that our love is going to be drawn out by what we see in them. And let's just take a moment and, and examine this. Now, we know that there are three words in the Bible that can be translated love. You know, eros and phileo, and agape. The first one essentially is referring to self-centered, self-gratifying love that has really self as the end. Okay, we also call that lust. The second word is referring to a brotherly love. Remember the idea of Philadelphia essentially means uh, uh, the city of, of brotherly love. And it, it is a, a genuine love towards others, but the one that we often focus on is the third word, which is agape which means unconditional love. It's the highest kind of love that is willing to make the greatest kinds of sacrifices. Now, one thing about this last kind of love that we don't often think about is that there can be different things that motivate this love. Um, there's different things that, that would move us to, to make, as it were, this, you know, unconditional sacrifices. Now, the first, kind, uh, the first kind of motivation is where the object itself, that which we are loving, is the cause of our love or our pleasure or our delight or our joy. We love what we see. We love it so much it just draws our heart out. Now, we know from the scriptures, as we've already seen last week and we're reminded today, that it is our duty to love God, right? But it's also our pleasure to love God because God actually is beautiful. And when we look at Him, when the Spirit of God opens our eyes to Him and we see that beauty, our heart goes out to Him. It draws us out to Him. The object is the cause of our love. And so we give ourselves to Him. 
Now, this is also the kind of love that we have towards those that we fall in love with and those that we have married. We, we married our spouses because we saw in them something that drew our hearts out to them and we wanted to have them as our companion, as our spouse for the rest of our lives. It's also involved in others that we care very deeply about, uh, such as the children the Lord gives to us in, in our marriages or even friends with whom we are close. And we also know from Scripture that this is the kind of love that we should have, at least in some degree, towards one another, towards our brothers and sisters in the Lord, because when the Lord saves us, again, He begins to form His image within us. We all have something of the image of Christ in us, and that means there is something in us that should draw our love out towards one another. John writes in 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And, and why is that true? I mean, our brother seemingly is nowhere near, you know, how, how glorious God is. How is it that if I hate my neighbor, then I really don't, if I don't love my neighbor I, or my brother, I don't love God? How can that be true? Well, it's because each of our brethren have something of the Lord's image in them, and we can't not love them. We will always love our brethren. So we see something in them that is worth loving that makes us, well, that makes us love them, makes us want to do kind things for them, that makes us overlook perhaps offenses. This is really what has been called the love of complacence. And this is where you find your, your delight in the object itself. But there's another kind of love and another kind of motivation for this agape love, and that is the love of benevolence. Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines benevolence in this way, the disposition to do good, goodwill, kindness, charitableness, the love of mankind accompanied with a desire to promote their happiness. Now, in the first case, it was the object of our love that draws our love out. We love him, that person because they are lovely, okay? In this case, it really has nothing to do with the one being loved. It has to do with the lover, the one who is loving. We don't necessarily see anything good in the object, but we are resolved within us to do good to them anyway. Now, unbelievers share something of God's natural image. We, we talked about that this morning, but they have nothing of His moral image. And that means that there is nothing that is morally good about them. And so nothing of Christ in them, nothing of God's beauty in them, nothing attractive in them, and so nothing uh, of this nature to draw our hearts out to them. We're not necessarily going to find our neighbor, especially our enemies, to be attractive. You know, the fact that some of our neighbors actually attack us, make them even less attractive uh, because whatever redeeming qualities they, they might have are, are hidden by the offenses that they're committing against us. It's hard to see anything good in someone who hates you, in someone who's attacking you. But the point, I think, is this, that Jesus is not calling us to love our neighbor or our enemy with a love of complacence, but he's calling us to love them with a love of benevolence. We don't need to see something good in them to draw our hearts out toward them. Our hearts need to be moved with love towards them anyway. Now, let me just submit to you that that is the kind of love, both kinds of love, that the Father and our Lord Jesus express. I mean, think about this. What kind of love do you think the Father has for the Son? Well, the Son is His image. The Son is beautiful like He is. He loves the Son with a love of complacence because of His, uh, well, because of His likeness to the Father. He is the express image of the Father. We read in Isaiah 42, verse 1, where <clears throat> the Father is speaking about Jesus Christ. He says this, Behold my servant, look at him, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Notice he looks at Jesus and he says, I delight in him. 
You know, the Bible also says that when we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and we are clothed with Christ, that he looks at us in exactly the same way. He finds us also to be beautiful. But we weren't always like that, were we? We weren't always in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a time when we were a part of the world, and the world is not beautiful to God. As a matter of fact, you know, the world is his enemy. A, there's a sense in which God's at war with the world. Um, the love that he has that he displays toward the world is not a love of complacence, but it is a love of benevolence. He didn't send his son to save us when we were outside of Jesus because we were so attractive because he saw something in us that was worth saving. He sent his son because that is what was in his heart to do. We call God the, uh, the full bucket. You know, he, he is so full of love. This is a, an act of superfluity as his love pours out upon the world. When Jesus says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's talking about a love of benevolence. It is a, uh, you know, a, a love that is so strong that it makes the ultimate payment and sacrifice for us. But it wasn't motivated by us. It was motivated by God himself and the love that he has for us. If we took time to read Ephesians 1, we'd see that's the very reason why God uh, shows us this love. It's not because of us, but it's because of him. So it was his good pleasure to do this. This is the kind of love that he continues to show the world every single day. And, as Jesus tells us, the kind, this is the kind of love that he is telling us to show our enemies. It's really the only kind we can. As, again, we're reminded in Luke chapter 6, verses 35 and 36, Jesus says, but love your enemies. And is he saying, find them attractive? No, he's not saying that. Let, let their beauty draw your heart out to love them? No. But he says, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. He's kind to ungrateful and evil men. You be kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. If we stop and think about it, the parable of the Good Samaritan, what kind of person was the Samaritan helping? Well, he was helping uh, one who was ungrateful and, and evil, okay? But that is what, again, mankind is. So understand what kind of love he's calling us to love our enemy with. Secondly, we need to understand what that love looks like. Okay, what does this love actually look like? Now, we've already talked about the last six commandments, and it talks about, you know, the expressions of this love and what it's supposed to look like as we um, show it towards others. But we're reminded by the Pharisees that we can have the right form, we can go through the right motions, but still not do it in a way that is honoring to the Lord. We, we read in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13 that we can have great gifts and we can make great sacrifices, but if we don't have the right kind of love, it means nothing to the Lord, which means we can have the right form, but not have the right motivation. Well, again, this is where we come to verses 4 through 8 to show us what this love is actually like, uh, what must be behind the actions as well as something more of how it's expressed towards others. Now, let me just submit to you that this, verses 4 through 7, what we read for our text this evening, this is the same kind of love that we see in Jesus. If we read this, we'll see this is exactly what he was like. And this is the kind of love that he would have us to show our neighbors, okay? So... It's not, again, they're not going to be drawing it out of us. It has to come from our hearts. And we'll talk about, of course, we already have, but we'll be reminded where that love actually comes from. But this is what it looks like, okay? So he tells us that, that we need, first of all, to be patient. I'm only going to touch on these briefly because there's a number of them. We need to be willing to suffer for a long time in doing right to others. That's what patience means. Patience doesn't mean that, you know, that we're just waiting and having delight while we do it, but we're waiting and perhaps suffering while we're doing it. We need to be kind, willing to do good to all, uh, even to those who do wrong things to us. Again, think about the Good Samaritan. 
Jesus is our good Samaritan, calls us to be a good Samaritan. The good Samaritan was kind to somebody who had wronged him, somebody who hated him. Uh, this kind of love is not jealous. Uh, we are content with what the Lord has given to us. We are content with what the Lord has given to others. We don't envy them for what, uh, for what the Lord has given to them. This love is, is not, uh, does not brag, and it's not arrogant. It doesn't become proud over things that we've accomplished or think we've accomplished. It doesn't boast about those things, but rather gives all the glory and honor to God. Certainly our Lord Jesus Christ did that. It does not act unbecomingly. Now, that simply means that it's not rude, not without manners, but moves us to behave in a way that brings honor and glory, that reflects well upon the Lord. Remember, we are living letters, read and known by all men. Does not seek our own things, you know, or at least this kind of love will not move us to seek after what we want and what's good for us, but rather what is good for others. Remember, if the Good Samaritan was concerned only for himself, he would have been like the Levite and the priest that passed by on the other side. They were more concerned about what was, you know, it's fun for them. This is work, you know. I don't want to help this guy. It's going to require some time and energy and expense and let somebody else deal with it. But the Good Samaritan wasn't thinking about his own thing, what was good for him. But he was concerned about the man who was in need. Uh, this love is not easily provoked. We don't, and this is one that, you know, that we, is, that we perhaps deal with more than, than others, but it doesn't become easily irritated and upset over personal offenses or when things don't go our way. By the way, in describing this love, remember, we all fall short in many different ways, but this is the love our Lord calls us to and gives us the ability to do. Uh, does not take into account wrongs suffered, doesn't keep a record against anyone of, of the things that they have done. Oh, that's, that's a hard thing to do. Again, if the Good Samaritan had kept a record of all the offenses that the Jews had committed against him, he never would have stopped. But if he happened to have a list when he saw the man in need, the list went out the window. Again, if Jesus on the cross had, had thought about all the things that had been done to him personally, uh, he never would have prayed as he did. So does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Isn't happy when our neighbor does the wrong thing or when our neighbor gets into trouble for doing the wrong thing, but rather rejoices in the truth. That is when they believe and they do the right thing. Uh, love gives us the ability to bear all things, to cover over the minor annoyances, the offenses, perhaps even the great ones, again, as our Lord Jesus did on the cross. Peter reminds us, above all things, be fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, love believes all things, puts the best construction possible on what we see others doing. Uh, William Perkins, I, the father of Puritanism, by the way, if you ever have a chance to read anything by Perkins, I think you'll find it worth your time. He has this to say, and I think it's very good advice, very good counsel. He says, do not despise your neighbor, but consider yourself as bad a sinner and that the same defects may fall on you. If you can't excuse what he does, excuse his intention, which may be good. Or if what he did is evil, believe he did it in ignorance. If you cannot excuse him, believe some great temptation fell on him and that you would be worse if the same happened to you. And give thanks or give God thanks that it hasn't happened to you. Do not despise a man for being a sinner. For though he is evil today, he may turn tomorrow. One thing Jonathan Edwards said in his resolutions was that when he saw somebody in sin, rather than despising the person for that sin, he would humble himself and realize or consider that he himself was a worse sinner than that individual. And when you put it in that perspective, it well, keeps you from becoming proud and judgmental. And really, apart from the grace of God, we are worse sinners. 
Uh, Paul goes on to say we should hope all things, we should want the best for everyone, and we should endure all things. Again, bearing all offenses with patience. Now again, this is how Jesus was towards all of his neighbors. And again, it wasn't because they were lovely, but it was because he is loving. Now, that gives us again the key to understanding how we can love in this way. We need to understand that we can't do it in our own strength. We can't do anything the Lord calls us to do in our own strength. We didn't come into the world with these particular virtues in our hearts. Without Jesus, the very best that we could do would be to approach that which the Pharisees achieved, which is the right form without the right motive. We're certainly not going to find the ability to do it in the objects that we're called to love, particularly when it comes to our enemy. They're not going to be able to draw it out of us. But we can love as Jesus loves because of the Spirit. He has given us the ability. He has given us the power. This love is the blessing of the new covenant. It's the work of the law written upon our hearts, which is not only towards God, but also towards our neighbor. Um, perhaps some of you will forgive me for using this illustration, but uh, there's a particular songwriter from uh, the, um, the 80s, I think it is, who um, wrote a song that's called Love is Not a Feeling. It's an act of your will. And that's not an altogether accurate way of putting it, but I think it gets it mostly right. We are to make the choice, we are to make the will or the decision to love them. It's not necessarily going to be a feeling. It's not because we feel like doing it, especially not from, again, the, the affection we feel towards the object. We may not feel any affection towards them, and yet we still need to do it. We need to will to do, them, uh, to, to do good to them. We need to will to love them, but it's not altogether without feeling. Because if we have the Spirit, there will be affection. There will be this desire, but it's not going to come from them. It's going to come from, from the Lord, okay? We can do this if we love the Lord, and I think that's the reason why, the, well, not the only reason, but the reason why the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength, right? If you love Him with all, then you'll be able to do all that He calls you to do, uh, it's, it's almost as if he's saying, just be caught up in me, love me, love me sing, you know, uh, exclusively. Because if you do that, then you'll be able to do what, what I'm calling you to do, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, even though you may not necessarily be drawn to love them by what you see in them. You will be drawn to love them by what you see in me. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. So our love for the Lord will give us the power to love others and will help us to be able to love even those that we normally love when perhaps that love is growing weak. So if we love the Lord and we put Him first, if we, which we will if we have the Spirit of God in us, then loving others, loving our neighbors, even the worst of them, as Jesus did, is possible. All things are possible in the Lord Jesus Christ. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. But in Christ, we can do all things. He has given us the ability to do it. Again, remember what Augustine said, Lord, command what you will and give what you command. I can't do what you command, but you can give me the ability, and I know that you will if I belong to you. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to um, strengthen our love for Him so that we will be able to love others as He calls us to love them.